most micros can make sounds of some kind, even a little handheld job like this one. Today we're going to be looking at how some micros can be used to generate music and speech, and we're also going to start looking at languages other than basic. Well, the writer of the music we heard at the beginning of the programme, whose fingers were indeed trembling over the keyboard, was David Ellis. Well, you were making some fairly sophisticated sounds there, but let's start with a simple sound on this machine. Can yeah, we? sure. Well, firstly, let's actually think about what makes a simple sound. We've got three things, really, to consider. Firstly, there's the pitch, how high or low the sound is. Then there's the duration, how long the sound actually goes on for. And then there's the volume, how loud it is. Now, on the BBC microcomputer, we've got a command called sound, and this enables us to assemble the ingredients to make a simple sound. Well, first of all, we have to think about which channel of sound we want to use because the BBC Micro actually produces four sounds through four channels because there's a sound chip buried deep beneath the cover of the machine which is beavering away producing these four sounds. So first of all let's go for channel number one. They're number dot to three. That's right, yes. Next we come to the volume. Well the volume can be from minus 15 up to zero. Minus 15 is in fact the loudest. A bit unfriendly but you get used to it. Makes some sense. That's right. Well we put in minus 15 there anyway. Um, then we come to the pitch. Well, I'm going to put in a value of four, and four, in fact, is middle C, halfway up the average uh, piano. Next, we come to the duration. Well, I'm going to put in 20, which is a sort of reasonably short length. And then when I hit return, we'll hear the sound. It's a long way from being music. <laughs> yes, it's pretty boring. The point is, if you're writing a simple little tune, a tune is actually made up of sounds of different pitches and different durations strung together in what you hope is a reasonably interesting way. So let's do something like that. In fact, what we're going to do is write a program which will change just one of the parameters in the sound command, in fact, pitch. So I'm going to write a simple four next loop going from zero up to 200. And I'm going to go up in steps of four. And that means that the sound that you actually hear will go up in steps of semitones, i.e. producing a chromatic scale. That's rather like going through all the keys on a piano, including the black notes. Absolutely right. OK, so on the next line, we then put in our sound command, and we go sound one, the same channel, the same volume. Then we put in the name of the variable, pitch, and finally the duration. And I've selected two, which is certainly nice and short. And then finally, on the last line, we put next pitch, just to complete the loop. And then we can run it. Well, it's more fun, but it doesn't sound much like a piano. <laughs> no, well, the point is that all the sounds actually in that run are still starting and stopping, just like the original immediate sound command that I executed. And if we look at this bit of graphics, you can see how the pitch and the volume suddenly starts and then suddenly stops. And that's pretty boring, really. Yes. But in real life, you'd rarely get a note as simple as that. Oh, that's true, yes. Well, we can look at that train again on some graphics I've got. I think this is a 440 from Paddington coming along. <laughs> and you can see that as the train comes near the man, the volume builds up to a peak. That's the bottom line. That's right. The and then the pitch the drops down to a lower level. So what we've really done here is we've taken our original sound and twisted it a bit. And we've actually given it a shape. We've gone from the rectangular shape of starting and stopping to something which is nice and smooth with a sort of bell shape to it. So the question is, how did we actually do that? Well, if you actually look in the program that we used to generate those graphics, we can see that there's this command called envelope here. And this is the second command in BBC Basic for making the sounds. Now, it's a bit more complicated than the sound command because we've got 14 parameters that make it up. And those 14 parameters actually generate the shapes of the pitch and the volume of the particular sounds that we've been looking at. And we call those shapes envelopes. It looks a very complex command. It's a bit tricky to use because you've got to work out all those parameters. What you can do is use the utility program, which works those numbers out for you, or at least you hope it will. Now, I've got another little program which I can demonstrate to you, which actually turns the BBC microcomputer into a simple little synthesizer using sets of those envelope commands. And what I've done is I put onto the special function keys sets of these 14 envelope commands, which will create different sorts of sounds. So, for instance, if I set in that number, I get that sort of sound. That sort of sound with another set of numbers just by changing the various 14 parameters. That's right, but we can also go through the parameters one by one and change them. And if, for instance, we increment... You can hear that the 
the sweep of the pitch is changing. There is, as yes. I change that number. Now, I can play three notes at once on this. It's great, isn't it? But the problem is that entering music from a typewriter keyboard is not a very easy way of putting music in. And I've got a more sophisticated setup that I use over here. But in principle, it's pretty much the same as the other machine. You've got a microcomputer here, a disk unit, a display, and an input device. Yes, that's true. This time, you've got some additional hardware, which is really a souped-up version of the sound chip, which produces 16 channels of sound. And the input device this time isn't a typewriter keyboard, but a proper music keyboard. Now, the point about this keyboard is it doesn't actually produce any sounds. What it does do, though, is it produces data, which is sent down the ribbon cable into the computer. And that data corresponds to the notes that are played on the keyboard. So if I play, then I've just sent information into the computer corresponding to that chord. So those and are on-off switches, just the same as those that are on the keys on the ordinary micro. Yes, that's absolutely right. Now, the point is, if I can actually play a line of music on the keyboard and send that as data into the computer, I can then record that data in the computer's memory. And then I can access that data out of the memory and play it back with an instrument. So we're recording the, the notes, or numbers, in fact, into the memory, and then we're taking the numbers back out of it, and then putting our envelopes and so on on top. So let's just try doing a bit of recording with this. OK, so I recorded a line in. That's been allocated to a particular part of the computer's memory. And I can now put another line in on top of that. And then I can put a third one in on top of that, the tune. And then finally we can play that back to make sure we're happy with it. That's great. Now the important thing to remember is that all you've recorded into the computer are numerical representations of the notes played on the keyboard. It's actually rather like having a word processor where you put the text into it, and then you say, OK, I want to print out that text with a different character set on the printer. So I can now take a line of music and play it back out of the memory with a completely different sort of instrument. So let's do something like that. <laughs> So you can see it's very flexible, really. But one of the problems is that not everybody can play a musical keyboard. And if you're having an off day, or if the music's very difficult, or it's very fast, you might have a few problems. So what we really want is an alternative means of actually inputting the musical data in the first place. And one way of doing it is using numbers, the sort of things we were doing with the sound command. And I've got here an additional bit of hardware and some software, which enables us to do things along these lines. In fact, what we've got is a box that produces eight channels of sound rather than four, and it also produces a further channel which contains seven different percussion sounds. And it's being fed with data along this ribbon cable from the same computer. So let's build ourselves a simple little drum pattern. Well, here we see on the screen that for the pattern we've got 16 steps, and these steps represent the drum beats that we can put into a drum pattern. Then along the top, we've got the actual drum sounds themselves. And as I build up a drum pattern, you'll be able to hear what they sound like. Now, wherever I actually want a drum sound to occur, I put an X. And I hope I get the X in the right place. Now, I've just put in the bass drum. I'm now going to put in some snare. OK, so it's gradually getting there. Now I'm going to put in some closed hi-hat on alternate beats. And next, I'm going to put in some cymbals here. And finally, I'm going to put in an extravagant tom-tom roll. OK, and now we can listen to it. The point is you can take one pattern and then chain it to another pattern and so on, and build up an ever-changing drum bass for your piece of music, which is great fun, really. Well, the other thing you can do also is to actually put in your notes in the form of numbers. So let's put in the piece of music that I've already put the numbers and also the percussion track in, so we'll get both the pitch parts and the percussion out of. That's absolutely terrific, but you haven't actually played anything there, you've actually just put numbers into the machine. That's itself. right, it's all by numbers, and of course that means that if you've got something which is very difficult, you can do it with numbers instead.
I see, yes. And so far we haven't produced any n music notation at all. That's true. Well, I've got another program which I can load up. So if I just load that. If you look at the screen, you can see we've now got two staves on it. And when I play the keyboard, the music played on the keyboard will then actually appear on the screen as real musical notation. So when I press the space bar, I'm given a metronome, which I have to play along with. Well, I don't know what Bach would have thought of that. Not a lot. <laughs> but once I put the notes into the computer, I can then print those notes out as hard copy on a printer. And if you made a mistake when you were playing it in, could you actually, would you have to replay it before you could correct it? No, you wouldn't. You could just tell the computer to go to the part of the notes that you've entered where you made the mistake, and then you can edit it okay. using part of the program called the music editor. In fact, over here, we've got a slightly more sophisticated music editor, which allows us not just to enter and edit one part of music, but in fact three pitch parts and the percussion part as well. Let's have a listen to it. I think you really are trying to catch me. There's something wrong with that first bar. Dead right, actually. <laughs> that C there should, in fact, have been a B, so I've got to edit that. And so we now take our editing cursor down to that, the bar where there's that incorrect note. And now I take that bar into the edit part of the display, and I want to correct that C. So I take my edit cursor along to that position, and I'll tell the computer to replace that C with a B. And you can see it, it's now put right that incorrect note. And now I can return the corrected bar into the original piece of music. And we've now got a B rather than a C, and it's all OK. So now I can play that to make sure. Yeah, that sounds OK now, doesn't it? It does, yes. So how long is it going to be before we can type in a whole score for a complete symphony orchestra and then play it back in our own homes? Well, sticking my neck out, I'd say two to three years, will give us a micro, which will be the all-singing, all-dancing machine. And be cheap and easy to use. Well. And how long is it going to be before we can get singers on it and replace Pavarotti and people like that? Well, actually, we can already do that, because you can buy as an add-on for the BBC Micro a speech chip. And we can just try having a go with that. We use the sound command as before, but we use a different channel. We use channel minus one. Mm -hmm. And we now have to put in the number corresponding to a particular word. Because inside the micro, there's uh, a ROM, which contains about 200 or so words. And each word has a particular number given to it. Mm -hmm. So let's choose, say, 179, which is, corresponds to the word computer. And we'll put that in and then finish off the sound command. Computer. Well, did you recognize whose voice that was? Well, it sounds a bit to me like a computer imitating a human voice. Well, actually, it's Kenneth Kendall's voice that's encoded in the speech from in the computer. Well, 200 words doesn't seem to be a very big vocabulary to me. No, it isn't. Um, what you do to get around that, actually, is to use bits of other words. And so we can take any of the words on this list and then chop and change bits of them and then string them together to create different words. And can you make up whole sentences? Oh, yes, you can. And now for something completely different. Well, I think it'll be a long time before that's reading the news. <laughs> yes, I think so. Thanks a lot, David. In earlier programs, we've written little bits of code in BASIC. And as we've seen, for some applications, BASIC is very hard work. And it often helps to use a program written by someone else or even a different language. For many serious and advanced applications, we want to be able to communicate with the machine in a language which is related to the job we want to do, whether it's the language of the musician or the steel worker. At the Scunthorpe Rock Mill, the rolling of steel is a continuous 24-hour process. Red-hot steel billets are rolled out into rods, then looped and coiled, ready to be made into anything from barbed wire fencing to supermarket trolleys. The mill is computer controlled, but with the rod moving at about 20 miles an hour, it still needs men to try to prevent the steel jumping out of its guide and causing what's known in the trade as a cobble. However, things do go wrong, and this causes particular problems at night when an engineer might not always be on hand to sort things out quickly. So they've installed an ordinary commercial micro to help diagnose faults. It's using what's called an expert system, which can be used by any inexperienced operator. The program contains a set of rules defined by an expert, in this case, the steel mill computer engineer. 
In the middle of the night, when he's not there, the operator can call upon this system, which communicates with him in the language of the steelworks. The program asks him questions about the state of various pieces of equipment at the time when the fault occurred. And depending on the answers, it follows a particular line of investigation until the probable faults are identified. In other words, the program applies the expert's knowledge and his rules to help narrow down the reasons for the breakdown. In this case, a scanner head fault. Well, that program wasn't written in BASIC because there's a better language, a better tool, if you like, for that type of application. You can use another language in the machine by loading it from disk or cassette or maybe using a special ROM. For example, a language called Microtext was used to write this program. Its main advantage is that it makes designing the screen format extremely easy. The expert in this case was a doctor and it's a health diagnosis program which questions you about your lifestyle and according to the answers you give, gives an opinion on your general health. Well, I've already put in some information about my age, my sex, my height, and my weight, and one or two other questions, and I've got to finish it off. Do you smoke? No. Can you eat more or less what you like without after effects? Yes. Do you take drugs? No. And that's about it. So we see what my general health is. At the moment, your general health is probably quite good, but your answers indicate that your health could benefit from a few simple changes in your lifestyle. Your answer suggests that you may be overweight. Carrying too much weight is not only unattractive, but can also increase your susceptibility to some types of disease, notably heart and circulation problems. Well, of course, the opinion it gives is only as good as the person who sets the questions, the expert, and it's quite clear to me that in this case, he got it a bit wrong. Well, this program behaves in a totally predictable way. It's not learning as it goes along. And perhaps the most exciting area for the future of computing lies with programs that are able to learn. And we've got one here. This is a program called Animals, which is a type of 20 questions game. The computer's a set of questions and possible animals stored in its memory, represented by this tree of possible roots. At the moment, we're at the base of the tree at this point here. And we've got the first question, is it a mammal? And depending on the answers, it will go up one or the other of the branches on this. Well, in this case, I've chosen zebra. Is it a mammal? Yes. Does it have stripes? Yes and it's going up the yes branch. Is it a carnivore? No, it goes up the other branch. And it's come to the end of the tree, or the top of the tree. Is the animal a zebra? Yes. Well, it got it. But the most interesting part of this is when it gets up to the top of the tree and it hasn't got the answer that you've predicted. So I'm going to play it once more, and this time I'm going to choose a robin. Is it a mammal? No, and it goes up the other branch. Is it a bird? Yes. Does it fly? Yes. And it's gone right to the end, or the top of the tree there, is the animal a duck? And it's only got one flying bird, and it's not a duck. No. Well, it gives up. What is your animal? Well, my animal I've chosen is a robin, so I'll type it in. Robin. Give me a new question. Well, a fairly simple question. Does it swim? What would the correct answer be for a robin? Well, at this point, we're right up at the top of the tree at this point here. And what we're going to do is to replace this end point with a new question. And the question is, does it swim? And as I hit that, two new branches come up, one of which will be Robin, and the other one will be the duck. So I can try it again. Do we want to play again? Yes. Is it a mammal? No. Is the bird? Yes. Does it fly? Yes. Does it swim? And we're right at that point there. No. And there it is. Is the animal Robin? Yes. I got it, want to play again. Well, of course, this program's very limited because it can only go further and further into the tree. It can't use two answers to infer a third, for example. For that, it would be better to use a more sophisticated artificial intelligence language. But it's not only possible to teach the computer new facts, but also a complete sequence of tasks. Our researcher, Catherine Robbins, has been using an artificial intelligence language to talk to a robot. Base. No. This robot arm is being controlled by a high-level language which recognizes spoken instructions corresponding to the various parts of the arm. Its wrist, its shoulder, its elbow, and so on. Elbow. Hand. Before I can actually get the arm to move by using these instructions, I've got to teach the computer to recognize the pattern of my voice for each of the keywords which I'm going to use. Wrist. Well, now that the machine has learnt to recognise the sound of my voice, I'm going to train the arm to pick up a beaker. The instructions I give the machine will be stored as a single routine. Shoulder. 
Yes. I can use each instruction to make the arm move a precise amount in any direction I want. Elbow. Yes. Eventually, I finish giving it all the commands necessary to make it complete a routine. In this case, that's reaching over, bending down, and picking up the beaker. Quit. Yes. Once the routine is completed, the arm is then reset. Well, having taught the machine a routine, I can now call up the sequence whenever I like. In this particular sequence, we've called beaker for the sake of argument. So we'll see whether it works. Beaker. And away it goes and starts to work. I could also teach it other routines, such as put and box. Then it would only be a step away from understanding a complete sentence. Put beaker in box. Well, that's a very nervous-looking robot. Next week, we'll be getting our own robot, the BBC Buggy, to appear to do intelligent things. And we're looking at how we can link the computer to the real world, sensing what's going on, and controlling equipment. Is that all it does? <laughs> well, see you next week. The computer book published by the BBC is available from bookshops at a price of £6.75. For details of other parts of the project, including notes on the television programmes, the BBC microcomputer system, the BBC tele software service, associated correspondence courses, and information about other courses, computer clubs, and other sources of local advice, could you please send a 12 inches by 9 inches self addressed envelope with 16 and a half pence postage to Broadcasting Support Service? P.O. Box 7, London W3 6XJ. And could you please indicate clearly what information is required? And if you want the notes on the television programmes, you must enclose an 80 pence postal order payable to Broadcasting Support Services with your stamped addressed envelope. Now, before the latest weather news, here's a brief look at what we have in store for you on BBC One tomorrow evening. At 6.55, the question is, will Nyssa survive in part three of the Doctor Who story, Terminus? Then at 7.20, we have more Vox Pop from Darwin in Lancashire. Terry and June go in for some home winemaking at 7.50, and then Brian Blessed tells the story of a great little Polish railway at 8.20. After the 9 o'clock news, Peter O'Toole stars in the final part of Masada, and that's at 9.25. People and Power includes an interview with David Steele, MP, leader of the Liberal Party, at 10.55. And we end tomorrow night with the evergreen comedy of Phil Silvers as Sergeant Bilko at 11.40. And BBC One ends tonight with a few last words on the weather from Jack Scott. <laughs>